The day I am recording this is October 20th, meaning it's my birthday. So what better way to celebrate than by doing a run that is very loosely based around the concept of gift giving. So today's the day we figure out can you beat Fallout 3 with only gifts and rewards. Let's quickly go over the very arbitrary rules that I've set for myself. Obviously, as the name implies, I can only use items that are given to me, be it a quest reward or just because. As most quest rewards are in fact caps in Fallout 3, I decided that I can only use these caps for repairs. This is simply because if I could just spend them willy nilly, this would just be your average Fallout 3 playthrough. Should any other rules come up, I will mention them when necessary, so with all that out of the way, let's begin. Right as we start a new game, we are already given two gifts, those being the gift of life and the worst name ever by our parents. After we absorb the life essence from our mother, a year goes by and I get to assign my special stats. Nothing too out of the ordinary other than a higher focus on endurance and strength. The idea behind this being healing supplies are most likely going to be non-existent, so the more health the better. And the same can pretty much be said for ammunition, so being able to hit good with a melee weapon will come in handy. After that arc of our characters over with, we have a 9 year time jump, conveniently enough, to our 10th birthday party. This is pretty great as we are given a Pip-Boy, a comic book, a sweet roll and a baseball hat by the residents of the vault. I also avoid Beatrice like the plague as even in this run I know that poem is worthless. We then head down to the reactor to get the BB gun and can shoot the Rad Roach absolutely guilt free for once. I then hurry Jonas along with some persuasive pellets and before you know it I'm 16, life is fleeting and I get to assign my tag skills. I take small guns, melee weapons and explosives. Small guns and melee weapons for increased damage with those weapons, and then explosives so I can immediately disarm the bomb and megaton as soon as I exit the vault. Speaking of escaping the vault, when it's time to leave, Amada gives me a pistol with 36 bullets, so I add that to my arsenal along with the BB gun. I don't take the baseball bat as while it was probably a gift from your father at some point, there's no way to prove it so I just leave it here. Despite the fact I said I have limited ammo, that doesn't stop me from lodging 5 bullets into Officer Kendall. I also decide to actually help Butch's mother for once as doing so gets me Butch's tunnel snakes jacket which is much better than the nothing that I am currently wearing. From here I just run to the end of the vault only stopping to sneak attack officer Mac and shoot the overseer a few times for no reason. Entering into the wasteland for the first time has me level up and I just pile all my points into speech and then take the lady killer perk. The idea being I'll be able to persuade people to give me better rewards. I make good use of this right away by going straight to Silver's house and making her hand me over 400 caps. Again, these can only be used for repairs. With my money in hand, I head over to Megaton, briefly chat with Lucas Sims, and disarm the bomb. This nets me another 100 caps, but more importantly, he gives me a house along with a robot butler. This is by far the best gift I could ask for, as not only can I rest in the bed to fully heal myself, but the robo butler can occasionally give me 5 bottles of purified water. While that does not sound like much, let's keep in mind that these are more than likely going to be the only way I can heal myself in this run. Not quite finished in Megaton yet, I head over to Creative Supply to answer Moira's questions about the vault, and just like that I get a substantial improvement to my defence as she gives me the armoured vault suit. I briefly considered helping out with the Wasteland Survival Guide, but most of that quest has you going and retrieving items for her, so that's not something I can feasibly complete in this run. While I may have good armour for the start of the game, the fact remains that my only means of offence is a BB gun and a 10mm pistol, both of which are low on ammo. With that in mind, it was time to find someone who would willingly give me a melee weapon, and it just so happens I know the person. The Antagonizer. The trip to Canterbury Commons was danger free, which was nice. At one point I considered becoming the Mole Man as it seemed like I was about to lead a small army of mole rats into the city. Sadly though, they left before I entered the town. When I arrive, I let the Antagonizer and the Mechanist have their little scuffle, and once they're finished I agree to help the town by dealing with both of them. To get the weapon that I want I would need to go after the mechanist first as I need to give his suit to the crazy ant lady in order for her to end up giving me the ant sting which is a unique variant of the kitchen knife. Fighting my way through the robots wasn't really an option so lucky for me I have completed this quest many times before so avoiding them all is fairly easy. I then watched the longest door opening sequence in the game and once again aware of the fact that I have very little in the way of offence use my gift of speech to talk the mechanist into giving up and in return he hands me his suit. I then take this suit to the antagonizer and she congratulates me, giving me the weapon I was after. The base damage of the weapon is a pitiful 6, which I won't lie is a little concerning. However, the weapon's main strength lies in its damage over time effect that deals 4 damage every second for 10 seconds with each swing. Being the gentleman I am, I then thank the ant lady before I leave and now that I have a way to defend myself, decide to initiate the second phase of my plan. This has me travelling towards Rivet City. On the way I got to test the knife out in some raiders and while not the best melee weapon by any means, it still manages to get the job done. I'm not a fool though so I make sure not to get into a scuffle with the super mutant just outside of the town with a minigun and once I mark Rivet City on the map, I head down into the nearby metro tunnels. 
The tunnels are filled with more raiders, again, nothing too stressful to deal with, being only level 4 at the minute has its advantages I suppose. It's when I emerge from the tunnels things get difficult. You see, I'm trying to make my way over to the Museum of Freedom to get another gift, but to do so I need to run right past a group of super mutants. Usually I would spam healing supplies at this lower level to make it, but as that isn't an option, I die. A few times actually. I decide to be smart and fast travel back to Megaton to get a good night's rest, and then when I come back I make a mad dash for the trenches in hopes of being able to outmaneuver and take cover from the mutants. Somehow this actually works and I manage to make it to Underworld with just over half my health. Now, as for the reason why I'm here? Simple. I'm going to get Charon. Any other followers out of the question, but seeing how I can get Azrakal to give me Charon's contract, I'd say the man himself counts as a gift. To get Azrakal to hand over the contract, all you have to do is take out the waitress at the rival bar, which, if you manage to do it stealthily, is fairly easy. I then return once the deed is done, and Charon, realising he no longer has to listen to Azrakal, destroys him, and thankfully this has no repercussions on my end. With Charon by my side, I travel back to Vault 101 and I'm about to head for Smith Casey's garage when I remember something interesting. If I decide to go to Paradise Falls, I can get Grouse to give me the Mesmatron, which, while a decent weapon, has the chance for me to daze people, which in turn, gives me the option to convince said people to hand over their stuff to me. Realising how this could severely help the run, we begin making our way towards the slavers. On our travels, Charon proves just how deadly he is with that shotgun as he manages to basically snipe people with it. Lucky for me, friendly fire isn't a thing or this would go south fast. Arriving at Paradise and I'm able to convince Grouse that I'm quite the slave wrangler, despite what some videos on this channel would tell you, and in turn he gives me the Mesmatron. Not having any interest in actually completing this quest however, I stab Grouse with my knife which sends Charon into a frenzy and he begins slaughtering his way through the slavers. Noticing just how efficiently Charon is able to cut down every slaver standing in his way, it becomes clear to me that the chances of me actually managing to daze somebody before Charon reduces them to a memory is fairly low. That said, I'm not complaining, as after all, the reason for me coming here to get the Mesmatron was to make things easier for me, but if Charon's already doing that, then it doesn't really matter if I don't use it that much. Almost like we have some sort of yin and yang thing going on, while I have high defence and low offence, Charon is the exact opposite. So, to circumvent that problem, we begin heading north for Oasis to see about getting him an upgrade. Charon gets to once again flex some more raiders on the way, but for once I actually manage to make a contribution to the fight and get some experience. That is one major downside of him doing a lot of the killing. I'm only really able to get experience for completing quests and the odd enemy that manages to escape his grasp. Before long we arrive in Oasis to smell the colours and rather than agreeing to kill Harold, I instead offer to help out Leaf Mother Laurel. In doing so will reward me, or more accurately Charon, with a special suit of outcast power armour as well as a hood to protect his overly fleshy scalp. Getting to the heart isn't so easy though as we have to fight our way through a colony of Mirelurks that also include Mirelurk Kings. And yes, I said we as I actually managed to help out considerably this time. Although I think I may have been swinging a bit too wildly as I may have poisoned Charon a few times in the process. In the final part of the cavern I decide to run straight for the heart and just cross my fingers that Charon's able to fight his way through and not get overwhelmed. I am lucky once more as we're both able to survive this ordeal, albeit barely. I then return to the Leaf Mother, tell her I applied the special oils, and then I receive Charon's rewards. The armour looks great on him. The hood, however... Well, it kinda looks like his brain is poking out through the top of it if I'm honest. Never mind that though, it's another job well done, and after returning home to heal, the two of us head off to mark Lamplight on the map as it'll save time later. As I am approaching Lamplight from the north for once, I get into a few scuffles that I wouldn't have if I'd gone the way I normally do. This included fighting a unique raider named Torture, who hits pretty hard and as a result, once he's dead, it's once again back to the safety of my bed. Continuing on the path from where we left off, I ended up going toe to toe with a rad scorpion by myself and managed to give him the old circle and stab until he eventually stops living. We also ran into a group of super mutants, where once again, despite the fact I am trying my very best with what's at my disposal, Charon continues to just steal my kills. From here it's a short jog to lamplight and I decide I may as well go past the speech check to get me inside. I then get the only appropriate piece of headgear for this run by convincing Sticky to part with his hat. As ready as I could ever be, I decided it was time to head to the garage and start the main quest. Only thing of worth that happened on the way was that I proved my sheer strength by stabbing multiple holes inside a robot with a kitchen knife. As we enter Vault 112, I am given the vault suit by the Robobrain, so I'm actually allowed to use it for this run and as such I quickly just enter the simulation and bring my gift of death and communism to the inhabitants of the vault. After leaving said simulation, Dad informs me he's heading to the big boat and I was inclined to join him, but as we left Smith Casey's it occurred to me just how close we were to Tenpenny's tower and I can think of one specific gift that I wouldn't mind getting. After we make our way inside I attack Chief Gustavo and from there becomes an absolute bloodbath. I'm stabbing folks, Charon shooting anything that moves, and Alistair Tenpenny decides to go kiss the concrete. 
We keep this up until I get the quest, aptly named Tampany Tower, which tells me that I can now head down into the nearby tunnels, and from there can inform Roy Phillips that he is the new owner of a luxury hotel. He rewards my efforts by bestowing me with the Ghoul Mask, which not only stops feral ghouls from attacking me, but also helps Sharon's self-esteem as now he's the prettiest out of the two of us. With my face now looking like a dropped meatball, we make our way for Rivet City to see about continuing that plot. The first task is of course heading to the Jefferson Memorial and dealing with its mutant infestation. I do this by following the shortcut from the Mr. Burke video, and this time my ankles don't come out through my shoulders, and within no time, Charon and I- Oh who am I kidding? Charon clears out all of the mutants without breaking a sweat. I then complete some menial tasks for Dad before he decides to off himself in style. Something I thought that was worth mentioning is that I entered the room fast enough that I nearly made it to the control room of the purifier with Dad and Autumn. I loaded back to see if I could get in, but sadly the door was already closed by the time I made my way back up. The ghoul mask actually ended up coming in handy during the escape as while I still had to kill the ghouls in the sewers, they didn't end up attacking me and instead focused on the much tastier scientists. We also lost Garza in the tunnels. I should clarify I actually mean lost, like he was nowhere to be found. Dr. Lee didn't even bring up his heart condition, it was weird. Once we arrive at the Citadel I let the living have their conversation and then I make Pal and Gunny grant me the gift of power armour training. While it would make sense for me to take the power armour back that I gave Charon, I decide against it because first off, if he dies, I'm screwed, and secondly, you don't take back a gift from someone, that's just mean. I then get the necessary information about Vault 87, and thanks to our earlier adventures, me and Charon head back to Lamplight and within no time are nice and cosy in Murder Pass. While the mutants here are numerous, they aren't at all bright, and in some situations, I'm actually able to take some of them down by myself. Just ignore the fact that in the time I managed to kill one, Charon has probably killed about five or six of them. With that said, we fight our way through and actually kill every single one in our way until we get to Fox. Fox is actually integral to the success of this run, as he's the only other person who can grab the Gek, and as such, the only person who can give it to us. I tried asking Charon, but apparently his life contract does not involve him being an errand boy, it's only for killing. Oddly specific, but okay. Just remember that part for later. Regardless, it doesn't take long for Fox to grab the device, and in turn for me to take it and pass it on to the Enclave. I am then increasingly hostile towards Colonel Autumn for no good reason until the President frees me and I can take back my gifts and be on my way. This is where I realise that without Charon I am in a pretty bad spot at the moment, mainly because I have very little health and only a few bottles of water left for my butler to heal with. With that in mind, I equip the Mesmetron and cross my fingers that I could de as one of the soldiers in hopes of them giving me their armour, as it would help out even just a little bit. The first time I tried this, it went about as well as you could imagine. But I'm willing to bet that this is because the soldier I tried it on was constantly shooting me with his laser rifle. Second attempt and I try it on one with a melee weapon, and sure enough it works, and not only do I get his armour, but also his ripper. While this may seem all well and good, the truth is I still lost too much health as I was still being fired on the whole time by other members of the Enclave, and as such, when I get greeted by these two soldiers, I get killed every single time. Trying to kill them wouldn't work, and trying to avoid them was even more difficult, so once again I just loaded back to before I even tried this, and then just skipped past all the guards not bothering to engage any one of them until I met up with Eden. I actually don't plan on using the FEV virus this time, but it is a gift after all, so I'm obliged to take it. On the way out of the base I do manage to daze one of the soldiers and get a suit of power armour, but considering I'm going to be getting a set of T45D from Sentinel Lions at the final battle, this seems kind of pointless. When I get outside, Charon is nowhere to be seen, so I have to head back to Underworld to pick him up. Now, before I shotgun the ending of this game, or more accurately, Charon shotguns the ending, I come to the realisation that the party that Vault 101 had for my 10th birthday wasn't all that great. I mean, Andy destroyed my birthday cake, the Overseer joked about child labour, and Butch literally tried to beat me up. To that end, I think it's about time I go back to the Vault and have a party of my own, that may or may not end with me playing Pin the Knife in the Vault Resident. I had this plan to kill everyone and then leave the Overseer till the end, but then something strange happened. As I came back up through this door as I thought I'd gone the wrong way, the Overseer just appeared down next to me and Charon and was completely hostile. Charon being Charon, this was obviously a death sentence for the Overseer as he got his head blown straight off within a few seconds. This kinda threw a wrench in my plans as it made the majority of the other residents, such as Butch, hostile and as such they were put down quickly. Ironically, this didn't make Amada hostile, and instead she just spoke with me as if I had just completed the quest, and was not angry that I'd came in knife swinging. Not wanting to leave a job half finished, even if it didn't go as planned, I then channel my inner Butcher Pete and begin hacking and whacking all of my former neighbours. Considering they're only wearing jumpsuits, this doesn't take very long. I also make sure to go get Andy, you already know why. I then clean up any stragglers I find, and once enough blood has been spilled, and I am satisfied, I leave the vault for the second and final time. The Overseer's password is booty. I felt this was information that we all needed to know. 
With the final side quest out of the way, I returned to the Citadel to look as out of place as I possibly could, got my new suit of power armor from Sarah Lyons, and then began the slow march to the Purifier. As usual, there's not a lot to say here, especially as a melee focused character like myself, not a whole lot of people to stab when the giant killer robot is on the scene. Inside the memorial, Charon, Sarah and I easily make our way through the Enclave and for the briefest of moments I considered sparing the Colonel, but ultimately decided against it and instead contributed to the fight by firing off the last two bullets that Amata gave me at the start of the game for the 10mm pistol. I tried to use the Mesmatron as well, but it was as useless as ever, so it was back to the knife. When everyone was dead, for some reason Charon decided to vent his frustrations by shooting lions in the face repeatedly, but she didn't seem to mind though. Remember when I said earlier about how Charon wasn't an errand boy? Well apparently that's not the case here as I'm able to tell him to hop on in and enter the code, and in probably the most fitting ending to this run, Charon proves himself as the true hero of the story, ending the game and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 3 with only gifts or rewards. I really enjoyed this run. It was a simple premise, but it was fun to have a good incentive to do side quests for a challenge given how important the rewards were. It was also pretty fun because this is the first Fallout 3 video I have done on the Xbox version, meaning it did not crash every 5 minutes. Regardless, that's going to be the end of this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like. If you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe to try to have one of these videos out every week. My name's Norbert. Stay safe, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.